Welcome to the world according to Boyer, where we bring top investors, best-selling authors, and business leaders to show you the smartest ways to uncover value in the stock market. I'm your host, Jonathan Boyer. Today's guest is Brandon Bridenauer, CEO of publicly traded Angie Home Services, the global leader in home improvement. Through their collection of brands such as Angie's List, Home Advisor, and Handy, among many others, they are creating the world's largest digital marketplace for home services. Brandon, welcome to the show. Jonathan, thanks for having me. Well, before we start, you know, full disclosure, both IAC and Angie have been written extensively about in our research service and clients of Boyer Asset Management own shares of both. So before we get to some of the exciting things that are happening at Angie, I just wanted to briefly discuss your, your career path. Prior to Angie, you work for both Scholastic and Nutrisystem, two companies obviously not in the home improvement area. So how did you end up working for Angie? You know, I've definitely followed an unusual path to where I am today. I started my career at Accenture back when I was Anderson Consulting and really was a technologist and a, and a software engineer. And probably around 2000, I, I left and went into, this is during the middle of the dot-com boom. I, I went to a small startup. This was in 2000, so it didn't last long. And then over the last, you know, over the, over the ensuing probably 15 years or so, I really worked in consumer e-commerce. And while the businesses might not seem like they have a lot of relevancy to home services specifically, they were all sort of unusual, bespoke services to consumers. A lot of them were continuity or subscription-based. So I have a lot of experience in dealing with consumers and thinking about things over life cycles and, and via lifetime value. I came to what was Service Magic in 2011 as Chief Technology Officer and Chief Product Officer, again, a combined role. And spent you know about seven years redefining Service Magic or rebranding it to Home Advisor, and then embarking on this effort to to redefine you know how home services work and how people take care of their homes. A couple of years ago, my friend and former CEO here, who I've worked with at Nutrisystem, retired, and I was fortunate enough to be able to take the helm as CEO. And I, I love asking CEO CEOs of public companies, you know, what is it like running a public company? Do you enjoy it? If you had your druthers, would you rather be private? Well, that's a great question. I've been doing this since late 2017, and it has been an incredibly interesting and very challenging experience, and certainly one that propels a lot of personal growth. I think adding a pandemic onto that experience has made it especially both interesting and challenging. The way I think about this is there is work I might prefer to do. I love building products. I love focusing on the day-to-day of like figuring out how to build great products. And obviously, I do very little of that now. But if you're trying to do something incredibly ambitious, which is certainly what we're trying to do, there's no better position or role in which to you know, have an incredible influence over, over the outcome. So I, I think about less about the sort of day-to-day, hour-to-hour view of what I'm doing and how much it's my preference and more about what we're trying to accomplish and the incredible leverage I have and in, in, in trying to propel us forward. That's a great answer. One of the things, though, that is difficult about running a a public company is obviously you're you're mark to market every day. You know, at the Boyer Value Group, we're long term patient investors. We try not to look at the day to day fluctuations of stocks. Easy to say, very difficult to do. Like many stocks, yours has been particularly volatile this year. You know, ranging from four ten to seventeen ten. And that's something that's completely out of your control. How do you get your employees and yourself from not focusing on too much of the daily moves of the stock price because it's obviously a significant part of the compensation and, and their total net worth. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. You know, I, I don't love the volatility and I don't think anybody possibly can. Certainly we try to follow sort of the precedent I think that was set at Amazon where we one don't spend a lot of time talking about it, but to the degree we do, you know, when we're at the lows, we talk about the fact that the external market doesn't really know what we're doing and can't always appreciate it. And we're at the highs, you know, we, we say the same thing that really it's relevant to what we're trying to accomplish and how we measure ourselves and how we mark ourselves against our performance. You know, it's not a perfect strategy by, by any stretch of the imagination, but I think one of the call it a benefit, one of the benefits we've had is we've had, you know, some serious highs and some serious lows and back and forth. And I think people have to some degree now gotten used to it because it has become a pattern. I hope it's not one that necessarily persists into the future. But I also talked to our team about the fact that every every successful company, the most successful companies, have had that same pattern in their in their history. Whether it's Amazon or Netflix or anybody you really name, they've all had that that pattern of volatility. And so I think that's a little bit calming to know that that is 
realistically the path that any incredibly ambitious company follows that goes on to become you know hugely successful. I'd say the last thing on that is we do benefit, I think, by having IAC as a control shareholder. IAC and the management there and Barry Diller definitely take a very long-term view of this and a very long-term view of the opportunity. And so having their support and that structure definitely puts us in a safe position to to swing big and, and really pursue this with a long-term view and not necessarily get caught up in a, in a quarter-to-quarter grind. If we were you know, a traditional public company, that certainly might be more difficult. And IAC, you know, which owns roughly about 85% of your stock, you know, they recently announced they're no longer going to be giving quarterly guidance. Is, is Angie following suit? We are. And I, you know, personally think it is a really smart move. You know, I've now lived that experience for directly a CEO for eight quarters and then for a few quarters before that in very close proximity. And I think with regard to what we're doing, you know, what we're trying to accomplish, quarter to quarter variations volatility is is frankly pretty irrelevant. It certainly doesn't end up being irrelevant to the market, but it is irrelevant to what we're trying to accomplish and whether or not we're on the path to doing so. So I think we're still going to publish our quarterly results and people are still going to care a great deal. But I think trying to publish a number, you know, a year out or whatever the case may be, and and then try to live up to it, which of course is fundamental to issuing guidance is, I don't want to say a waste of people's time, but certainly not the most efficient use of, of the time and resources of some very you know important people whose mind share is better spent elsewhere. So I really want to kind of dig into Angie because I'm really excited about the company. You know, we have a pretty diverse audience on the on the world according to Boyer. Can you just briefly explain what Angie is? Sure. Well, we're definitely a collection of brands, all of whom are focusing on the exact same thing, which is we're we're really trying to transform the way people get home services. And I think more broadly speaking, we're trying to reinvent the way people care for their home. The status quo in how people care for their home is a very subpar experience, I think would be a nice way to put it. And it's pretty antiquated. And the vast majority of that activity you know, happens offline or happens in a very analog way. And it's certainly, I guess, odd that you know home services is probably the biggest laggard category when you think about all the consumer verticals in terms of moving from offline to online, nearly every other category has been reinvented or disrupted in some significant way by online services, while home services has, has really has really lagged. And our view on that is, is that it's driven by two different things. One is, is that just fundamentally, in terms of demographics, homeowners skew quite a bit older on average than perhaps most categories. The average age of our customer is around 53 or so. And these are folks that just aren't digital natives. They didn't grow up doing everything digitally. And you know, the internet mostly came, when you're looking at that sort of population, came after college or you know, after their education. And so there's a behavioral aspect of having done things one way for a very long time that is stubborn to change. Um, that's point one. And then point two is you also have to deliver an experience and service that's, you know, as they say, 10 times better than the, than the status quo in order to disrupt and influence that behavior in a new direction. And I think both of those you know, one, the, the demographic aspect has been an inhibitor. And then two, I don't think the service that's 10x better, you know, has existed quite yet. There's certainly services that are better and have augmented, you know, the classic way of doing things with UGC and consumer reviews and that sort of thing. But you haven't seen the, the truly innovative types of services that you've seen in other categories. And that's obviously what, what we're aspiring to and what we believe we're building and delivering for, for homeowners. We have uh, a few brands in the U.S. I think the Home Advisor really has been the growth engine, you know, of the company over the last many years. And then Handy is a very innovative service we acquired a couple of years ago that really delivers what we think is the next generation style of experience, which we call fixed price services. But you can really think of as as, as on demand services that delivered in an experience that's very similar to those which you get in other categories. We also have the leaders in several of the Western European countries, but those businesses are earlier stage and, and quite a bit smaller. So is the market opportunity, I, I've seen numbers all over the place, you know, somewhat about 400 billion and about 10% right now is, is online. Is that, is that about, is that roughly correct? That's roughly correct. We, we redid the numbers recently in terms of the, the TAM and we have it at about 500 billion. So it's grown a bit. The 400 billion number was from probably close to a decade ago now. And then in terms of the online penetration, we, we still have it below 10%, but it, you know, it's a little squishy in terms of getting it exactly, but that, that's definitely in the ballpark. So this is obviously a huge opportunity and you, know, you are well-funded, obviously, you know, with IAC's backing and you know, after they just spun out maps, they have a lot of cash, but you know, how are you able to compete against giants like Facebook and Google who are also 
trying to get into this market? Yeah, that's, you know, I think that is one of the most interesting questions because it's certainly a question that weighs on most investors' minds. There are two different ways to look at competition. First, there is competition for advertising dollars among small businesses. As a small business, any small business has a myriad of ways to advertise and uh, small businesses in the home services space have advertised uh, you know, historically on TV and in directories and the yellow pages. And then obviously with the advent of the internet, they can, you know, they have a bunch of additional options, including a paid search in Google and advertisements on Facebook and, and the like. I think one on that front, we compete very favorably with any service that exists because I believe we have the best, the best offering for service providers. I could go into some detail on why that is, but we offer a platform that offers a level of targeting and a granularity in terms of control and ROI tracking that's never existed. And if you think about the way it would work historically, you put an ad in the yellow pages or maybe on the top of an online directory. And it's very difficult to know what kind of response you're getting, You know exactly what you're typically paying a fixed price every month, and you don't necessarily know which phone calls come from the ad. In our platform, in our ecosystem, you know, you know exactly what what you got and you know exactly what your ROI is. And you can be very specific about not just that you're a plumber in Denver, but in fact, you're only interested in doing tankless water heater installations and you're only interested in doing them in three zip codes. So it's a level of control and power that has just never really existed. However, I think that I think that, that is really not the long-term way to think about competition. The way I think about our ambition is that we're trying to create a transformational consumer service that reinvents the way people care for their home. And when you think about that as an ambition and a mission, very focused on home services, we don't really feel that we have anybody competing to provide or accomplish that same goal. And in the end, most of this activity is offline. And our our challenge is to create that transformational service and move that activity that's happening offline to online. When I think about Facebook or Google or any of the large platforms where you can advertise, the odds of them creating a truly transformational, deep, service that is you know, explicitly focused on the home is pretty unlikely. We have literally thousands of people that get up and come to the office every day with this one, with this one goal in mind. And home services is complicated. There's enough nuance and complexity and specificity to the category that I think trying to be a jack of all trades across a bunch of different categories and come up with a really great solution is pretty, is pretty unlikely. So it's really your level of, of focus compared to the behemoths is what's going to make you guys win. That's right. And and I'm sure as we'll talk about fixed price a bit, but we are moving from being, I think, what was historically a lighter marketplace where we connected people. And I would would think of that as more of a traditional advertising model to a much deeper, vertically integrated fulfillment platform. And suffice to say, that gets more and more difficult the deeper you go and the more ownership you take over delivering actual services. It gets complicated. And I think I think those types of services, when you look at them in today's world across categories, whether it's something like Uber or whether it is, you know, a DoorDash or Grubhub or or any of the services that really, you know, have have true vertical integration and manage the fulfillment, you don't see the big mega platforms competing as much in those areas where I think you see them competing more are in lighter, simpler information sort of discovery areas. So certainly you're seeing that in, in flights and travel and perhaps in hotels. Because you're really just connect, you know, you're an aggregator and you're really just connecting via platforms that are readily available. If you want to actually start delivering services, it's really an entirely different level of complexity. And I think the level of focus and the investment required in terms of humans and operations and logistics is pretty difficult to take on. You know, today's July 29th. It's so, and we're talking about competition and, you know, it's particularly timely because the leaders of Facebook, Apple, Amazon are I don't know if they're on Capitol Hill or they're doing it via Zoom or or whatnot, but they're talking about competition and a monopolistic behavior. Do you have any views on that? I mean, Google is probably your one of your biggest sources of traffic, but it's also in some ways your competition, as we just discussed. I mean, do you have anything you can elaborate on that? Sure. First, as just a consumer, uh, you know, a, a person living in, in the United States, I look at the last 20, 25 years of incredible innovation driven by the internet and all the amazing companies that we as consumers benefit from, and that certainly the economy as as a whole has benefited from. And I think if we want to see that for the next 15 or 20 years, the, the ability to discover these companies, these businesses, these innovative services is crucially important. So Obviously, with the dominance Google has in terms of in terms of offering search and discovery services, I think it's a completely reasonable thing 
for the government to take a look at. It's just so important. I do believe if you take a longer view of this, we all certainly want to see innovation flourish. And we want to see these amazing new services developed by by, by entrepreneurial folks come into being and, and be able to thrive. I don't have enough expertise to know whether you know there's a there there, but I, I do think it's a, a reasonable thing for people to take a look at. When I think about Angie Home Services, of course, we you know we think about these platforms. We think about Google in particular. They're a huge partner for us, an incredibly important source of finding customers. And I expect that they they always will be. In fact, there's no question that they're the best way for us to find customers. You know, that's where people search. So we value the the relationship and we value the the channel, if you will, from a marketing perspective as an incredibly important part of our business. But when I think about our strategy and I think about competition, I honestly believe we are either going to execute and be successful by developing a truly customized service that goes deep within home services and really attracts a very large audience of homeowners in a sticky fashion and become you know, the, a direct destination brand, or we won't because we didn't execute successfully. I, I don't believe that Google, you know, they're going to have an advertising business. They're going to have home services businesses that advertise there because they have an audience and that's completely reasonable. I don't think we're really competing, you know, to, to accomplish the same thing. Understood. But I mean, you have been, I don't want to say a victim, but when Google changed their algorithm, I don't know, it was a year or two years ago, you know, your costs went up, I think, 30%. I mean, and it's no coincidence that they are competing in the same category. So it, it's, it's something the government probably should take a look at. Google's a large source of customer acquisition for us. And certainly when they make changes, we are affected. We have you know, we have been affected positively in the past, but I think if you look at the course of the last 10 years, I think it's reasonably clear that Google's own proprietary products have incrementally taken up more space on the search result page, which just makes it a little bit more difficult or perhaps a lot more difficult for consumers to find those organic results in those services like ourselves. I do, <laughs> this is a this is to each person's own eye, but I do feel like they do occupy most of the the most premium real estate on the page. It's pretty extensive. And I feel from a personal standpoint at the, at the company, I feel pretty comfortable you know, with the risk profile and our ability to continue to, you know, to operate within Google at the level we are currently. I hope you've been enjoying the interview with Brandon. To be sure you never miss another World According to Boyer episode, please follow us on Twitter at Boyer Value. Now back to the show. One of the ways that I, I guess you're, you're planning on combating Google is, you know, to have a more direct relationship with the customer. And you're doing this with fixed price services. You know, can you kind of des- describe the, that opportunity? Absolutely. So we've been in business for more than 20 years, and it's, um, it's an incredibly complex problem in terms of solving home services. And it's, it's complex for two reasons. Uh, one is almost a math challenge, and the other one is really about humans and behavior. From a math standpoint, we serve all of America. We serve every single zip code, and we there's well more than 500 different types of projects that we do. So there are about 42,000 zip codes in America. And if you combine sort of the zip codes and the 500 plus services, you almost have what you can think of as 20 million micro markets where you have to have humans available to deliver services, and you have to balance supply and demand. It's an enormous problem from a scale standpoint. And on the human side of it, unlike, let's say, a service like Uber, where you can pretty much go out and find and mint new drivers really easily because almost everybody knows how to drive, in home services, you know, these are oftentimes craftsmen, people that not only have, but need to have many years of experience for many of these types of projects. And think about things like wood floor refinishing or, or remodeling or, you know, you name it, lots of complicated types of projects. You can't just go create these businesses. So you have to work with the economy as it exists. And so the combination of those two things makes this, you know, I think an order of magnitude or perhaps a couple of orders of magnitude more difficult than perhaps like the idea of creating a service like Uber. We have been working to standardize, you know, over the last seven or eight years, the experience for consumers and digitize more of the experience. And, you know, we have offered services like online booking, which enable people to you know, book an appointment directly with the provider. But what we have found over time is that it's very challenging to get hundreds of thousands of small businesses to operate in a consistent manner, I would say, of their own accord. And we essentially pivoted three or four years ago to begin a completely new approach to this problem. We really believe fundamentally that we need to provide a very consistent experience to homeowners. 
that solves several different pain points. First of all, there's like no price transparency whatsoever in home services. Nobody knows really what anything should cost. And if you go out and get estimates, you're often going to get estimates that are you know all over the board or, or like really not close to each other. So first of all, we think solving price transparency and helping people understand the price as fast and easily as they as we can is important. And then digitizing the remainder of the experience and taking out a lot of the friction. People don't want to talk on the phone anymore. Nobody wants to obviously leave a voicemail. People want to effectively, everybody's kind of time starved. So people would love to, when it comes to home services, generally, you know, once they get up the momentum to actually do a home service, they want to get it done as quickly as possible. So we embarked on a, a new path, which is effectively us pricing and selling the service directly to the consumer. And so we are determining, you know, based on whatever the project is, we're determining the price, we show the price up front, and then a homeowner can quickly, you know, order that service. They, you know, put the credit card in, tell us what date and time they want the service. And then we manage the, you know, we find the professional to complete the service at the requested price or at the indicated price. And we manage that fulfillment, you know, digitally beginning to end and including, you know, processing the payment once the service has been completed. It's a closed loop system where the entire thing from a consumer or homeowner standpoint is managed through the app from seeing the price up front all the way to watching the service technician arrive at your home you know, digitally via the map, and then obviously getting a receipt and seeing the payment processed. So basically what you're saying is the traditional, what you're trying to do now is let's say I wanted to have my gutters clean. I would go online. I would probably tell them how big my house is, whatnot, and there would be a fixed price of what it would cost to clean the gutters, and you would find the qualified person to do it. And I would not really have to communicate with that person at all? Is that is that kind of what you're saying? Well, that's exactly right. And I could simplify the whole thing I'm saying by by just saying it. it's, it's very similar to the experience in ordering a car service from Uber or ordering food from DoorDash. I think the only difference really is that it's typically not a same day service. You're, you know, you're scheduling oftentimes out a few days, but beyond that, the experience is very, very similar. And you can communicate with the provider if, if, if you want to or need to. But for the most part, no, there's no reason to. You know the price, you know the date and time the provider is going to show up. And they show up and do the work. And, and then when it's completed, we, you know, we process the payment. Along with this, of course, we guarantee, we guarantee the work. Uh, we guarantee the outcome. And, and we call it our happiness guarantee. And if something goes wrong, then we'll either you know, refund the money or preferably send somebody out to make it right. So that's a, a level of, I guess, confidence that you don't typically get with how people have historically gotten home services. And you've compared this to some way to Uber, which seems like a pretty good comparison. Uber is running into issues of these workers being classified either as employees instead of independent contractors. Is that something you're worrying about? Does that change the opportunity if all these service providers were classified as employees of Angie? Well, we certainly watch the evolution in the regulatory environment, but generally speaking, we are in a very different position because the entities that we're working with on the provider side are small businesses. And sometimes they may be sole proprietors or very small businesses, and sometimes they're much larger businesses, but they are, you know, they are generally speaking, standalone businesses. And we're not bringing them into this industry. They are generally running this business and they're taking consumers or or customers from other sources. I think that is pretty fundamentally different from, you know, from where Uber sits and, and some of the challenges they face. We'll, of course, watch it, but the home services industry has always been a small business driven contract oriented industry, right? Just the very nature of contractors and the fact that they use subcontractors to do remodeling projects or, or larger projects. It is the way the industry has always operated. And, you know, we're simply providing a digital medium on which you can interact in the same way that the industry has always interacted. Perhaps the difference, the different thing we're doing is obviously we are offering price transparency, which, you know, which is sorely lacking in the industry. But I think, you know, I think we're pretty outside the scope of where the regulatory focuses and gig jobs and and sort of gig businesses at the moment. And in terms of the fixed price kind of opportunity, you know, how big can can this be? Like, where is it now, you know, relative to sales? And where do you think it could be, you know, five, 10 years from now? Well, that's an interesting question because, you know, we do believe we use the term home services, but it's incredibly heterogeneous. And obviously, you know, fixing a leaky pipe shares very little resemblance to remodeling a kitchen or 
building an addition to a home. And those are just two examples, but there's many, many of those. And so the question for us is this fixed price model is, is we believe a fundamentally better value proposition for homeowners for the reasons I already mentioned. It's also a great deal for the service providers because rather than paying for advertising, they just receive what they get. A, they, we pay them, right? They have a, they have a job and they don't, you know, they just receive compensation for it. So we love the model and we think it is really strong for both sides of the marketplace. But the whole nature of pre-pricing a project gets more and more complex as you go up the scale, you know, in terms of project complexity and project cost. We started by launching in about 130 different types of projects that are low price and relatively simple. And we did that last year and we have seen a lot of success with that and that continues to grow quickly. This year, uh, that I should say that that first segment that we tackled, we think is about 50 billion of the 500 billion in total TAM in the home services market. So relatively small slice from a TAM standpoint, because these are low price services, but a very high volume part of that from a service request volume standpoint. So we love tackling that first because we think you know, while it's you know relatively small from a revenue standpoint, you know, given the whole market size, it makes up a big part of people's experience. Most of the projects that people do within a year are relatively low price from gutter cleaning to lawn mowing, handyman services, and, and those types of things. That's the most common thing that people do. So we love delivering this experience and making that the core part of how people experience getting home services. But what we've done over the course of this year is we've moved into higher value and higher price services, which is where you know we've had some question mark about about our ability to price it and about perhaps more importantly whether homeowners would would buy you know much more expensive services. And I would say in the first quarter of this year, we saw pretty quickly that when we offered services, and these are typically called the average prices around five thousand dollars. We saw very quickly that homeowners would engage. There was very high engagement, very high conversion rates to purchase these services. And that was, I think, the fundamental piece of information we needed to know there was a market there and something worth going after. Obviously, if homeowners are just too reticent to buy those types of high price, high ticket types of projects, then it would have been difficult to overcome. But we were able to prove out pretty quickly that, that there was an interest and a willingness to buy those services. What we've spent the last few months doing or tackling is is optimizing our sophistication around how to price those projects because they are much more complicated. And just to give an example, installing a wood privacy fence or installing a deck. These are the kinds of projects that cost a few thousand dollars uh, and which each one of them requires a different approach to pricing it properly. And so we almost have to go project by project and really figure out how to price that project such that obviously we make a reasonable margin and we can find providers, you know, to understand the, the clearing price in any locality that it requires to find providers to do the work at the price we offer. So we're in the process of getting good at that. I think we'll be in the process of getting good at that for the next at least year and a half, because it's effectively a, you know, a project by project ground war to figure that out. But, you know, we're seeing it grow quickly and, and we know enough now to have confidence that this model is going to scale to probably a greater extent of projects than we might have originally believed. That's sort of where we're at today. Can you just, you know, be, I'm just out of curiosity, something like the wood privacy fence, like how do you use technology, et cetera, to price something like this? It seems something that would be very difficult to do because I might not be able to tell someone how big the square foot of my property is, et cetera. You know, how does, how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are really two components to knowing how to price a project. One is understanding the specifics of a project given its nature and what are the factors that determine pricing. So with a wood fence, it's going to be what's the length of the fence, what kind of material are we talking about, that that sort of thing. And then the second aspect of it you need to know is really about the local market dynamics and what the going rate is to get a provider to do that kind of work. On the latter, because of our scale, we're building up expertise and sophistication quickly in terms of understanding local market dynamics. And I think that's a competitive advantage and a durable asset that, that we will possess that puts us in a, in a strong position to do this effectively where it'll be difficult for others. On the former, privacy wood fence installation is a, is a great example of where we're using technology to really accurately price these projects instantly. For privacy wood fencing, we use satellite imagery to quickly allow the homeowner to identify the, the length of fence, the segment of fence that they want to install or replace. And with that information, along with a couple of questions around materials and that sort of thing, we can quite quickly and accurately price that project. 
So obviously not every project is outside and, and you can't use satellite imagery for everything, but that gives you a sense of how the actual solution might be a bit different for each and every individual project. I should have mentioned that, you know, the TAM, if the first 130 or so projects were around $50 billion in total TAM, this next segment we're tackling, you know, is around $200 billion. So by virtue of the success we've had, I think early this year, we believe that we're going to unlock maybe not all of that TAM, but certainly a significant portion of it via fixed price. So, you, I mean, right now you went from a few hundred dollar project to a five thousand dollar project, which is you said about I think you said about two hundred million dollars of or one hundred fifty two hundred million dollars of the total addressable market. Do you ever see that going up? Like, is a remodel of a kitchen or some of these really high high margin items ever? Do you ever see that being kind of in a fixed price or quasi fixed price model? Our fundamental goal is to make owning and caring for your home a really different experience and a much easier experience. And the vast majority of what people do fall into these lower price projects. Most of them are sub, you know, most projects are sub a thousand dollars. And then occasionally you might have one that is a little more expensive. That probably makes up 90, you know, nine out of 10 projects people do, maybe, maybe even more. And, you know, what we want to do is build a brand that's synonymous with this type of innovative and, and transformational experience and develop really loyal customers. And I think fixed price as applied to these most common projects are what will generate that loyalty. To take it a step further, you know, obviously we ultimately believe that not only can we develop deliver fixed price projects, but we can begin to take ownership of all those repetitive projects that you do. So if you have to clean your gutters twice a year, but we can offer that on a recurring basis and we can offer in a way that you really don't have to think about it again. We just show up twice a year and let you know we're coming and do the job and, and let you know it's been done. And as you can imagine, there's there's a pretty long list of these kind of recurring known projects that people have to do where we think we can actually just take the the load and the labor off of people's minds and deliver that in, in a more automated way. It's through this experience, you know, if you can imagine not only having this fixed price experience, but having it via the app and then perhaps engaging with these recurring services. It's a pretty deep experience. We've got your credit card on file. It's really seamless to order additional services. I think the general idea is every once in a while, when you decide to remodel your kitchen every 10 years, or when you have to replace your roof, you know, once every 10 or 20 years, or your furnace, you know, we have the relationship at that point. I don't know that fixed price, as stated, will ever apply to something like a kitchen remodel. I think there may be some, some sort of simpler versions of it that it possibly could. But, you know, if a $40,000 or $50,000 or $60,000 kitchen remodel is probably always going to be handled differently. I think the, the point for us, though, is we can win on the high frequency projects, create this really deep and established relationship with the homeowner, and then we're automatically top of mind when those, those higher margin, higher value projects come up. One of the ways you're creating this you know, deeper relationship is you have you know, partnerships. You have one with Reology and, and one with Lowe's. That was, Lowe's was announced this, earlier this week. Can you briefly touch on that? Sure. You know, we started partnering with Realogy, I think it was middle of last year. And the nature of that that relationship is one that I, I really love because I, it's good for us, it's good for Realogy, and it's good for the homeowners that are selling their, their houses. So effectively, Realogy offers a program where a homeowner can improve their house, which improves their odds and price, their odds of selling the home and, and the price at which they can sell it. Realogy essentially provides funding for that work, and we provide the execution and management of the services. So this is, simply put, a fixed price service model, and it is more in the middle tier pricing, right? It's more in the single digit thousands of dollars type of uh, area from a, from a price standpoint. And it tends to be heterogeneous. So it's not usually just one project, but it's a, it's a combination project. Maybe I'm painting and reinstalling the floors or refinishing wood floors and so on. And so one, I love the program because I think it's the best of all worlds when it's in everybody's interest and everybody has a strong value proposition. But it's been a real proof point for us to essentially prove that we could manage and market these types of more complex services, particularly a heterogeneous basket of services, and do so at really high levels of satisfaction. So we've you know, we've been very happy with the program. I believe Realogy has been very happy with the program, and it's, it's been growing pretty consistently. Obviously, COVID threw a temporary curveball within the housing market. But as we've all seen, uh, demand has picked up very robustly, and you know we're pretty closely tied in terms of that partnership to transaction volume in the housing market. Um, that feeds in really nicely with just what we're trying to do overall. The learnings we're getting and working with Realogy and working in market on these types of complex projects feeds directly into serving you know, our own customers directly on HomeAdvisor, 
for these same kinds of projects uh, on a fixed price basis. So it's been very synergistic in, in, in that sense. And the Lowe's partnership, you know, we couldn't be more excited about. Obviously, it's brand new. Lowe's as a leader in, in sort of selling products and materials related to, to the home is somebody we're extremely happy to partner with. We obviously bring a lot to the table in terms of enormous service demand from homeowners. And I think there's a natural synergy to partner with someone who is looking at this from a product and materials or leading with product and materials. And as they continue to strengthen their relationship with, with home pros, our ability to work with them in partnership to deliver their pros, you know, service demand, I think is, is naturally in our interest and naturally in their interest. So I'm excited about it. Obviously, we just we just kicked it off. But I, I think it's pretty obvious that our position and scale and being able to deliver service to their pros and that then feeding, you know, potentially directly to product and material sales makes a ton of sense conceptually. In terms of how you're running the business now, I mean, from March till July, obviously you, you've been you know dealing with COVID. You know, how has that impacted your business in terms of what people are looking for? Is it now highly non-discretionary types of services people are looking at, or are people actually letting people in their homes for for other types of discretionary work? Well, I think we're obviously very thankful for the resiliency our business has shown throughout this. There were certainly a few weeks there in the early going that looked pretty grim, but the industry really bounced back with a vengeance and has performed really well, I think, given given the context. That said, you know, we are in the business of putting people inside of other people's homes to deliver services, uh, at least in, in, in some part. And that is not going to go without some impact when you have a pandemic and the kind of fear that is, that is reasonably pervasive. So what we're seeing, I think, in terms of the, the major impacts are on the demand side, there are, there are certain project types that are not growing, you know, are, are kind of flat to down maybe a little bit or, or growing much more slowly than we would have expected. These are typically indoor discretionary projects and remodeling projects are a great example. People are they haven't collapsed and you know i think they've been pretty resilient all things considered they're definitely dragging growth a bit relative to where we thought we would be because they're really important you know remodeling while the frequency is low the value of those jobs is enormous and uh, it's a, a, an important contributor you know to uh, to us financially so those are growing more slowly uh, and or are flattish year over year and the reason is people are you know people are scared there's a level of fear and if, i think maid service cleaning services is another one where we've seen actually really, really soft demand. And uh, that's one where people are, you know, they can do it themselves. And so they're choosing to do that to reduce, reduce uh, exposure. Luckily for us, 60, I think we said 65% or so of our business is non-discretionary. It's just work that people have to get done, whether it's inside or outside. If your AC breaks, you're going to get it fixed. <laughs> you know, it's just the reality. And then beyond the 65% that's non-discretionary, a lot of work is also outside, even if it's discretionary. And, you know, as you can imagine, people aren't as worried about that. So overall, I think, you know, we we saw a huge bounce back in growth. We posted the highest service request growth rate in June in two years on a year-over-year -year basis. So it was a, it was really a very strong recovery, but uneven. And what I mean by uneven is some categories are up 50 to 90%. Uh, I think it was in-ground swimming pool installation was up 90% year-over-year, -year, while other really important categories are, you know, flat to maybe a little bit down. So that's when you when you have the type of supply and demand challenge we do, trying to keep up with you know category growth that might be fifty or sixty or seventy percent out of the blue is definitely challenging, and that's a little bit of what we're working through now. On the provider side, providers are are affected in a few different ways. A lot of them kind of pulled back on employment and, and hiring during the early stages, and perhaps are either having difficulty hiring or haven't have, have been cautious to do so. There are supply chain issues that are affecting a lot of categories, and so we're seeing. I think it's more than 50% of providers are reporting that they're, they continue to be impacted by the pandemic and are effectively operating at a reduced capacity. So those two things are, I believe, transient quite clearly, but are, are definitely effects we're seeing as the pandemic continues in its current, current form. So you actually had people on your platform trying to get in-ground swimming pools. I mean, that's a major project. That's a you know, $50,000 plus project during the pandemic. Absolutely. So one thing, we haven't seen any consumer weakness. I think the consumer appears very strong, at least to this point. Obviously, that is a concern. That was a concern and continues to be, I guess, a future concern as to whether that, that maintains. But to this point, consumers have been, I think, very strong in terms of their willingness to do disc discretionary projects. 
where there isn't the risk of contagion. And so the impact is really around, it's very specifically around uh, concerns about having people at home and, and having exposure. Jamie Dimon, you know, the CEO of JP Morgan said, you know, savings are up, incomes are up, home prices are up. So you'll see the effect of this recession. You're just not going to see it right away because of all the stimulus. Is Angie preparing for future pain to come? I mean, if, you know, who knows what's going to happen with the stimulus checks now that they're running out and how they'll be renewed. I mean, is is Angie preparing for a deeper recession or, you know, how, how are you structuring your business? We really aren't. I, we operate the company in a very lean fashion in any case, which is why when COVID originally hit and demand dropped so precipitously, we took a look at our operations and how, you know, how we approach things. We certainly made some changes, but we were able to keep our workforce, you know, completely employed and quite frankly, focused on our longer term goals. So we didn't really miss a beat. And I think more importantly, perhaps than that, just in terms of operating efficiently, we have an extremely resilient business model. And that was on display during the initial what I'll call demand crash because we saw demand crash 40% plus in just a matter of days. The way our business works is that if homeowner demand drops, first of all, we have a, we have a surplus of homeowner demand in the first place, as we've talked about. But if homeowner demand does drop, a couple things happen. One is that service providers in general need our service much more. And that's broadly speaking, the service providers who pay us. So we generally see a much higher engagement level from service providers in those types of situations. And secondly, the kind of the way our ecosystem works is that if providers allocate a budget and if consumer request levels drop, then you just tend to see a higher revenue per request that gets processed. And perhaps this is at least partially driven by the fact that we do have such a big imbalance that, you know, if we do see some drop in in consumer demand, we're just able to better match those SPs against the remaining consumer demand. But in the end, if you look at our performance, which we released, I think in April was our low point uh, and you know, our global revenue dropped by 2% year over year. And that was in the heart of a really an unimaginable collapse in demand, unlike anything we've seen, including the housing crisis in 2008. So we feel really confident that whichever way this turns out, you know, we can stay focused, that the business will perform well. Of course, it can have some, you know, some impact, some moderate impact on our growth rate and, and financials, but we're going to be in a really strong position either way. And in a position, more most importantly, to stay focused on what we're trying to accomplish. You know, when you think about a three-year or five-year horizon, one of the effects people are predicting, you know, of COVID is you know mass shift of people to the suburbs. Whether that happens or not is is, is certainly up for the debate. I would imagine that'd be pretty good for your business, correct? We believe so. I, you know, I was looking at some data that just came out where home ownership amongst millennials just spiked in a pretty unprecedented way. That's certainly incredibly positive for us. We believe millennials are going to be an incredible tailwind to driving that behavioral change around moving this activity from offline to online. These are digital natives. These are folks that already order most products and services digitally across every other category. We have long anticipated and are certainly excited by what we think is probably a 10-year demographically driven wave where a lot of this activity does come online. And then just beyond that, home transactions, home ownership is incredibly good for us. Home transactions, there's a ton of work that happens before, during, and after home transactions. So that generally on a macro level creates more demand. So it, it's certainly some of the side effects of COVID, you know, with a focus on the home and and people perhaps migrating out of dense urban cities and into less dense areas where they can own larger homes are positive for us. Obviously not, not worth it. Not worth the trade-off in the world, but uh, those, are, those are side effects that are, that are currently sort of tailwinds for our business. Brandon, thank you so much for joining us on The World According to Boyer and sharing your vision for Angie. I look forward to following your progress on this exciting story. Thanks, Jonathan. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thanks again. To be sure to never miss another episode of The World According to Boyer, please follow us on Twitter at Boyer Value. Until next time.